this is not a recruitment podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Powered by People podcast. Um, I'm Harry, your co-host, along with we're welcoming back Ben today, our growth director. Um, And we're lucky enough to be joined by the amazing Steve Jacobs, co-founder of the the talent community, um, previous admin of the the old DBR community. Um, And tell us a little bit about your new role, Steve. First of all, lucky is... uh... (laughs) <laughs> you are the king of you are the oh, king of amazing but you're the king I of the group community am. yes um what was your question who are you steve who am i where do i start uh so steve jacobs um been working in the recruitment industry for oh gosh over 18 years now um, but don't really classify myself as a veteran just yet you're an absolute vet no nah, 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 definitely not i 100 percent but i still got my hair um, and, uh, Which I, yeah, I, before then, actually I was in, believe it or not, property. Uh, so I was, I was, I was in real estate. Um, just, I've never heard that story before. I mean, I'm an age of moving into recruitment. <laughs> what else can I tell you about me? Uh, I'm a trained chef. So I did actually train at the Landmark Hotel, uh, to be a chef because I was really interested in the, when I left school. Um, why was I Where did you go wrong? Yeah. Well, how did you end up in this industry? Oh, no, yeah. The chef life wasn't necessarily for me. It was, uh, it was like being in the army, actually. Uh, very, very similar. A lot of people say that. I would have just eaten it all. Yeah, yeah. And that was the other problem, just constantly eating everything, um, as you're trying it. Uh, but no, I'm today, I'm working for, um, a company called Seracor, uh, as a part of the HCA healthcare group. Uh, and I'm leading up on staffing, HR, recruitment. We're currently building out uh, our operations in the UK um, as part of the what's called EHR government mandate. Uh, right. So the government have basically manda- mandated that all private hospitals, all hospitals, or NHS uh, need to have EHR records, which basically is electronic health records, Yep. Uh, by March 2025. Um, so we are implementing the technology uh, to do that amazing i can um i can relate to that we, we've recently uh my wife and i've recently had a baby and they're just thank you and there just seems to be paperwork everywhere and no one really knows where it is or it's just your your midwife's constantly jotting stuff into into uh into paperwork it just seems like so old school yeah you've got one one so one time you go there and they've got a an ipad um and they're doing some stuff on you know on on an electronic uh device and then next thing they're back to paper again so that's that's the remit is transfer yeah there's a lot i mean there's a lot of process that goes into it because there's many different applications that you're building into it Mm -hmm. because i've learned so many different acronyms uh as well (laughs) to do with healthcare it's mind-blowing um and also understanding like what is a you know outpatient versus an inpatient and you know, uh, where, yeah, it's it's incredible. Yeah, actually. and and uh, again, learning these different words like ambulatory, I've never heard that before. The fuck does I that thought, mean? I know. I, well, I thought it was related to. Um, I'm gonna go with ambulances. Yeah. yeah, right. Me too. Yeah, but it's not entirely. Not no no. Can't remember what it is. This is why we're getting recruitment. Yeah. This is why we're in ambulatory. Ambl- 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 yeah. Um, but no, it's it's. it's it, I think what. You know, I've been working in the tech industry for a long time now, and this is the first time I've been working within Health. healthcare. Nice. And genuinely, I mean this, like the the way that the support of mm. employees and patients is unprecedented, right? It's incredible. They really care about their staff. They really care about the patients. Um, it, you know, it, it's, va- it's values all the way through. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've felt that being here. So I, I, when I see the, the types of work that we're actually doing, the difference that it's making by really saving lives yeah. uh, is incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Awesome. Um, well, sounds like you've got a real challenge on your hands and an exciting project. So good luck with that. We're here today to talk a little bit about communities, right? Absolutely. 
um, the king of recruitment communities. Um, what about king? A little bit about building communities and, and the value that the community or, or you know, being in a community or, gen or, or starting a community has in today's society, both in business and, and in personal. Um, I think we're seeing a huge rise in sort of particularly online and virtual communities um, with the younger generations. And I think this is it's a, a, a key opportunity for businesses to sort of reflect and, and actually uh, create a better brand awareness and, and impact through creating communities. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the communities that you've been involved with so far. Yeah, so I uh, previously to TTC, um, I was uh, part of a, a really fantastic community called DBR. Um, that had been established for around about eight years. Mm. You know, it had grown to 10,000 um, uh, members. Nice. Uh, it was predominantly in-house. And, um, you know, we had a lot of events and, and the way that it grew organically, you know, was was, was really, really impressive. And The fact that you got to 10,000 shows that there was yeah. a, a, need, a desire there to was. have that community. There was, there was. And, and you know, and I, and I started doing my own research um, looking you know because i'm in other slack communities as well that as, as just as a, just as a member a lot of us ones a lot of european mm. ones um you know not just actually uh, talent but also technology ones but the ones that are in you know talent and recruitment there's some really great slack communities out there yeah and uh but for me i i saw some things that were missing um around it was too you know, kind of exclusive, should we say, to, you know, predominantly in-house folks. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, TTC was was created, sorry, the talent community was created because we wanted to create a place for everyone in the recruitment industry. And yeah. we wanted to create a place where, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not you're from in-house agency or RPO, mm. but you were able to support each other, especially during these sort of times at the moment. Um, and to really kind of break down those barriers so that, you know, agencies can in, in, educate in-house, in-house can uh, uh, um, educate uh, agencies. And it works, yeah. right? It's, it's, like it's all about, exactly, it's all about communication. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, these barriers being broken down. We're seeing fantastic conversations that are being had. Um, and this is why we've done it. Yeah. You know, we, we're not, we're not, it's not to sit on a pedestal and just kind of say, oh, we've made this. It's just really about creating the platform so that people can actually share their ideas, help each other out. And, you know, someone maybe one day, someone want to, from an agency might want to go in-house. How do they do that? Yeah. What do they need to do? What type of skills do they need to learn? And how would they present themselves in interviews, et cetera? I, you know, I think that that knowledge share is arguably one of the the biggest pulls, right? Because the networking side of, or the, the lead generating networking side of communities have always been around, right? But years and years, you always had these like BNI meetings where you can all go and you get... 30 second pitch around a table and then like they've been around for ages, but they always lacked that sense of community, right? It was always quite cold, quite transactional, but I think by having the community and being more relationship driven and kind of removing that lock on your knowledge, because people have always held that very tight, right? Oh, if I'm agency, I'm not going to share anything with in-house. So if I'm an RPO, I'm not going to send anything to an agency. Whereas unlocking that, which has enabled that knowledge share has been so powerful, right? Yeah, exactly. Funny you mentioned BNI because um, I did actually used to be part of a chapter about twelve, wait, what was it, thirteen years ago, or fourteen years ago, um, and uh, exactly right. You would you would have a meeting, everyone around the table, you'd introduce yourself, talk to me, you know, how could you do potential business, but then as soon as you left the room, that was it. Yeah, no one really kept in contact with each other until the next meeting. Yeah, um, and I think. The, the problem that I felt in, in our chapter was that the encouragement around engagement wasn't there. That level, you know, the level just kind of, maybe it was because it was early days and there wasn't, you know, that type of experience to, to, yeah. to educate on that, but there wasn't that engagement to keep thing, the conversations going once you left the room. Yeah. So, um, yeah, now then obviously moving online is, is becoming a lot easier and there's thousands and thousands of of these uh not just slack communities but you know um not uh what's the one not messenger what's it called discord there's discord discord's yeah. great there's just whatsapp My communities, communities isn't there? there's whatsapp yeah. community yeah, i must admit that i'm not a massive fan of whatsapp communities 
because I'm part of one. Um, it's 250 members. Um, and there's some there's some great stuff in there. But if you don't... It gets if, lost. If you, yeah, it gets yeah. super lost. Yeah. Um, and if you don't read it every day, or, you know, there, there could be some gold that you've, you've, you've missed over. There's a thousand messages in there. And, yeah. and it's not as easy to do like searches back either. No. That's the other problem. Yeah, it's true. Um, but you can, I know that you can create sub, subgroups within that. Um, but I yeah. don't see how it's, you keep that level of engagement. You can't break out the conversations and yeah. different subject areas, which is why Slack is great for channels. Right? Yeah. Yeah, with 200 members plus, you, it's just that channel in WhatsApp gets archived from there. Yeah, yeah. Or, or muted, oh, muted at least. Yeah. yeah, it does, yeah. With with the Slack channels, if you're careful with it and you don't just have a thousand channels, that becomes too difficult to manage. And, and as a individual contributor, you're conscious of what you're adding to it. Um, then there are different elements. You know, you can you can make sure that you're you can go through each thing that the channel that's interesting to you. You can make sure you're following it, and you can make sure that you're contributing and adding value to it. Um, also, about finding the time to be able to do it as well. Yeah, it is. I do find that it can, that it, that is a real big thing, and being a part of too many communities can be yeah a, a little bit challenging sometimes. Yeah, manage your time in the right way. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. Um, <laughs> Uh, what a couple of things that I think could be interesting to talk about. Um, what makes a good community? Um, and how does somebody go around starting? You know, where do we start? Like, mm. let's say we want to create a community from scratch. Where do we start? What do we do? How, how does it work? The easy answer would say would be to like create a niche. But actually, what? What? So let me answer your answer your first question, which is you know what how how do you create a community right yeah um or how do you make a successful community sorry yeah it's from for me it's about priority mm -hmm. focus and listening to what your audience is asking for so you could have you know we've and we've doing and sometimes you have to do this through a b testing right you could have a bunch of different channels if, if some of the conversations are not being had or their channels are not being utilized shut them down right yeah. Keep the conversations that are going in one place. Yeah. Um, have focus areas, right? So it could be talking about the latest trends or it could be talking about, you know, job boards or HR tech, et cetera. Um, but you need, you, you know, as a, whether you're the founder or, or part of the founding community or you're a community manager, you need to keep that level of conversation going. Um, so definitely encouraging conversations going is very important. But again, quieting the noise yeah. and keeping it very specific to what people are asking what people are talking about you know asking for advice for instance yeah. um yeah. quite a fine particularly when you're starting off right quite a fine margin between facilitating conversation or moderating it too much right because correct you want it to grow organically don't you like yeah as soon as you see everyone having a little individual conversations and channels kind of popping here talking about this without you or any of your community managers leading that, yeah. that's the goal, right? Well, like with anything in life, it's about finding balance, right? And uh, you can you you can you can fall into this trap where conversations can go flat, and but they can also be over too too much noise going on, so you you miss the previous conversation. So yeah. again, it's about really kind of managing those conversations as they're coming down. Um, and monitoring them, but ke keeping it on point, right? Yeah. Sometimes you've got to kind of bring it back into it. Uh, but when it works, it does work, you know? Um, and then keeping that level of engagement as well. So sometimes when, and I've noticed this a lot actually, where if, you, if you're building a community, sometimes when people join a community, they, you always see the same names and the same people contributing, which is fine. But then it's probably only twenty percent, and there's eighty percent that haven't, and they, you know, they they are probably, you know, what we describe as lurkers, right? They kind of dip in, dip out, see what's going on, um, and I and what I find when I speak to some of them actually is that it's a, it's a confidence thing, so they're they're a bit nervous, yeah. right? They're not sure what to ask or if it could be silly or, you know, they don't want to sound like an idiot, basically. Um, how do we? How do you? How do you help them? Yeah. So it's about encouragement and. 
I think if you were to talk openly about things like imposter syndrome or, we, you know, kind of coaching around that confidence aspect, um, then I think that that would encourage people being, you know, open and honest and transparent about, we're all in this, don't worry. Like, you're not, you know, you're not the only one. Yeah. Um, and I think that would encourage people to, to, to speak up a bit more as well. It's really interesting. I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about it in the Rec Hub um, and a lot of conversations that, that I have with different business leaders is um, about the impact and power of vulnerability and authenticity that, like, in today's age. Um, and actually encouraging that within a community is, is, is super powerful. The more people you can get contributing, moving from uh, maybe we could call them consumers. Yeah. Um, they're consumers of the content and consumers of that community. Yeah. Moving them from consumers to contributors um, and it is, is really important. And also, it's getting feedback, right? Mm. So it's important to post polls or, you know, post um, feedback surveys, whatever you want to do to gather that data um, so that you understand what is your audience what is important to your audience? What yeah. do you want to see more of or less of um, so that you're you're keeping it to a good level standard? Because your, your audience is also always changing, right? You're, you're getting Absolutely. more people within the community that have different desires and needs from that community. Um, and then you're also, uh, the market is changing. And so what you're, what you're uh, in terms of value, what you're bringing to that community may have to change to, to sort of move with with that community mm. what one thing that i think if you were you know if you're not a business that's trying to create a community and you're just uh you know like you was just uh, a, a group of people that wanted to create a community how do you finance it are you are you financing that yourself no it's free really yeah no. in terms of building your slack's free but for slack is free yeah slack is slack is free I mean, you can get pro versions, nice. yeah, but they're very, very expensive. Yeah, and the pro versions really give you what extra. Um, the two main things, are, from my understanding, is it gives you more integrations. You can, yeah, you, you track conversations that have happened, you know, before the ninety days. Yep, um, and a few other things as well. But yeah, I mean, you can use it for free to start. That's amazing. Yeah, because we definitely pay for us. Like, yeah. well, cancel in that. <laughs> Um, but if you're using Slack for business, yeah. it's different because yeah. yeah. you have to pay for it. Um, that's cool. And so you, all the, the only real financial, the only real cost is time. Is your time? Time, yeah, yeah. Which is always up, but which is why it's really important to don't build it on your own. Get it, get yeah. get a team of really strong co-founders who are committed yeah. to the cause. Um, cause, it's not a charity, but. Um, but it is right. You've got a vision. Well, You've essentially got a vision for that community. It's not so. It is yeah. a. It is a. Cause There's always in a sense. It is in a sense. Yeah. 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 For a greater cause uh, to help the recruitment industry, um, and then obviously you want to identify um, community managers. Yeah. To you know and get really good people who are passionate about it as well. What makes a good community manager? What are we looking for in a, in a community manager? For me, someone who uh, is not afraid to get stuck in come yep. up with new ideas um keep conversations going um be you know be kind of there to, to as a kind of point of contact super uh but would inclusive. Have, super inclusive yeah. but i would never expect anybody to be like me uh online 24 7 no. you know that's just my nature i can't <laughs> help it i don't switch off but your wife uh, loves that yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so i think it's and that's why it's very important again to have many community managers that you can rely on so that you can share the time and share the responsibilities. Nice. Yeah, I think that's really, really important, isn't it? If, you, if you're doing it all yourself. Firstly, you're not getting other perspectives, so you're not able to, under best as best as you can, understand, yeah. the, the, you know, different different points of view. Yeah, uh, and they bring different skill sets. You know, every person yeah. has a different skill set, different experience, they, you know, they have different knowledge as well to share. So, you know, what what... Four people might come up with one person might come up with a better idea, but it might work differently, right? So yeah. it, it's good to have that variety of mindsets and skills for this type of for sure uh, group. Yes. Yeah. Do you think? Um, and this is a very big question, but do you think communities would have been as as big as they are if we didn't have that 
COVID period where people were really desperate for connection and it was very isolating. Do you think they still, communities would still be, this is very subjective, but do you think they'd still be as big as they are now if we've just been all bubbling along thinking everything was fine? It's a good question. Um, I think actually that COVID, I think, slowed it down. Yeah. Uh, because pe we were heading towards that way anyway, but I think people once, you know, they were either unwell or they became very isolated at home, a lot of people switched off. Mm, yeah. So they weren't, you know, online. They weren't engaged in conversations. They weren't able to get out uh, and talk to people or, or just, yeah, I think it really, really kind of slowed it down. But I do believe that we're, we're still growing, like community, communities in general are, are still growing depending on us on business. Or, yeah. yeah. But let's be, let's be honest, communities have been around for decades. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, most, it's, most it's, they've been like really big in the gaming, in the gaming community, if you like. Yeah, yeah, Discord. Uh, yeah. yeah, Discord is obviously huge in that state. My, my son is on Discord every day. Yeah. And what he's, so, you know, he started off, you know, a good example, right? So he started off as just a normal gamer, playing Roblox, you know, doing really well, loves it, absolutely loves it. And he became really good at it, and he started getting good following, then he joined Discord communities. Now he's teaching through these Discord communities. Wow. Yeah. So now he's, 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 he's like leading, uh, he, he has, you know, calls, um, that no one sees each other. Yeah. So it's good for security in that respect. Yeah. Um, but he's, you know, having kind of like not, I suppose, in a way, kind of like tutorial tutorials in a way, yeah. where he's telling them what to do here, how to do, what to collect, and I listen, you know, because I work from home, and you know, I can I can hear what's going on in the background. I always yeah. got to check, um, <laughs> but I listen to him, and he's he's like a teacher of uh, of it, and that is brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very engaging, and I think that's that's the power of communities, isn't it? Yeah. It extends your reach beyond mm -hmm. what you may have at, at your fingertips. Um, I mean, there's different types of communities. There are physical and, and virtual. Yeah, but that's bring people together. Look at football yeah. communities, for instance, right? Yeah. Or just general sport communities. It really does bring people together. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. So we've got like, you've got different types of communities. How, we've, we've, uh, and there's always that fine balance on how often you're putting physical opportunities to network and get together, the uh, virtual opportunities, and you don't want to be overbearing or, or actually not doing anything at all. We have, um, we call, call them communities within our business. Um, we're a remote company. So for us, we really wanted to establish a way in which different people can connect with others in the same business, but not just work related. Um, and so we've got like book club, we've got fancy football community, We've got what else? Gaming, We've got golf. gaming community, golf community, in. and it just a health hub. And we just got all these different communities that allow people with similar interests. How is that structured? Is that is that on one place? Is it on one workplace, or is it? Yeah, multiple? It's, it's in it's in Slack. Um, but then they have each community gets like a small budget that they can. Uh, they have to do they have to do certain things mm. that prove that there is a community worth having mm. first. Um, and then there was a small budget assigned to that community if necessary. So like book club, get a book a month or something um, to, to go and read a book and then they yeah. discuss it and they get together on whatever cadence feel you know feels necessary. Um, the golf community gets some money towards, you know, uh, tea off costs and things like that. But that sounds like um, it's more around your culture. It's like you're encouraging it. You want people to connect. Yeah, we want them to connect in in a community fashion mm. um, around similar interests, I suppose. Yeah, I, I guess it's about facilitating that that connection. Like nothing is is forced in that sense. It's a if you want to join one, join one. Mm. If you want to partake, great. If you also don't want to be part of that, then that's fine as well. And yeah. I think it's about like we said at the beginning. It's about facilitating that connection. I think mm. If you can inside of work, outside of work, if you can find something that you connect with, and ultimately I think you can find that sense of belonging. Well, I think we've touched, maybe we touched on this with Jeremy yeah. in the last episode. If you can feel like you belong somewhere, whether it's a workplace, a community, mm -hmm. you're arguably going to be 
you're going to be happier, right? Yeah, of course, your arms are open wide. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think that's what we try and do is just generate that sense of belonging. And I think nice. through the, the TCC as well, that's that's your aim as well. Yeah. yeah. Get get a, a group of people that feel like they belong together, have shared interests, shared passions. Definitely. And I think that's, as humans, that's... And you're not judged. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. thing. You know, like with Facebook, for instance, how much judging goes on in Facebook? It's all that it's happens. all that happens, <laughs> right? It's just it's not that kind of it's just not that kind of place. Yeah, yeah. I, it's the power of community because you wouldn't be a part of community that that you either wasn't interested in and therefore yeah. judge people for having that interest. Mm. Um, and because the rest of that community are passionate about that particular thing, yeah. the one person that comes in and starts judging gets shunned and, and pushed out. I think it, I think actually a lot of it are also around marketing, right? So, you know, you would use online marketing to create offline events yeah, yeah, yeah. so in a similar in a similar yeah. capacity you want to fashion and you want to create like an online community to create offline community events where you will get together as well like yeah. working and everything and then you wouldn't know unless you're actively involved to see what's it, going on yeah. and you know you need to know when the events are happening yeah um yes i think that's really important talking about marketing how can how can businesses be using community more from a marketing perspective? I think it becomes to everything that we just said that it works just as well internally as it does externally, right? Yeah. Like now we've done a big piece before how I think businesses, and this is definitely an I think rather than I know, but businesses are starting to blur that lines between how they market themselves internally to their, their people and mm. externally to their consumers. I think that's starting to become a bit of a gray area. I think as consumers, we're much more aware of how businesses treat their people. Um, and I think, as internal employees, we're much more aware of how people treat their consumers. So that that is really blurring. Um, so I think the same. If you're launching a product, you want to create a sense of community around that because, again, it instills that sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to invest into a product, physically invest into it by purchasing it, if you feel like it talks to you, if you feel like you've got shared values or your morals are similar to that organisation... That, that is a sense of community, right? As a business, if you can do that in your consumer, mm -hmm. then... That's, that's your employer branding. Go, like that. <laughs> I think, that, but that has changed, right? Because if you, if you years back, if you were going to launch a product or a service, you would just find that community, find where that the, the, the people live <clears throat> and just target it as opposed to create an opportunity to be a part of that community you just want to. You just wanted to sell to it. Yeah, so got it easier to find communities now. That whereas we're now it's like actually, we like you say, we what you, you, people want to feel like that product, that service is a part of their community mm -hmm. before they start to buy from it. Hundred percent. It's it's the same as I've said this on quite a few podcasts now, but the the sense of branding, external branding, that is about creating value, right? Mm -hmm. You have to create value before you can start extracting that. The why. Yeah, about the why. exactly. So by communities and by creating that sense of awareness or value around your product, of course, it's going to be an easier transition from taking someone that's looking to someone that's buying, right? Mm. It's, it's just, it's, it's going to be. And I think yeah. we're, we are as consumers so aware of being sold to. Yeah. And um, maybe it's a European thing. We, we've said a few times in America, I think there's quite a culture around being sold to. They like, like to be sold, sold, like to, to, be sold to, whereas here... We tend to be like, oh no, it's far too pushy, far too salesy, like softer, softer approach. Yeah, yeah. That's what we like. Yeah. Like, we want to be wined and dined. We don't want to be yeah, golf, you know, yeah. restaurants. So yeah. everybody likes to do business that way. Exactly. <laughs> because we're just more, we're just savvy as a consumer. Yeah. Our our access, that way. Yeah. Our access to information now is greater than ever before. So if a brand does, and now we're moving into branded rather than communities, but if a brand does slip up, for want of a better term, and you look at Brewdog, right? It's the same, by the way. You're saying we're moving away, but it is the same because yeah. a community is a brand in its, in its own right. Yeah. Right? And if you screw that up, you've killed it. Yeah. You know, you, know, you can make many mistakes, but some that can be rectified and some can't. Yeah. yeah. And then you've killed your own community. And you've got to be so careful. And exactly the example I was about to say. So Brewdog created a huge community, right, around kind of we're anti-establishment and it's kind of by the people, for the people. And literally overnight, there was a big scandal about how they treated their employees. And within almost a week, it, 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 was awful. it all fell apart. Worst place to work. Yeah, it was. And actually, it turns out that hardly any of it was true and it was all disgruntled ex-employees. But literally overnight, that community was shattered yeah. due to yeah. the, the, the perception of the brand. Gas media. 
Let's be honest. That's I'm, another podcast. Yeah, that's a whole other. You know, I I worked for McDonald's uh, when I was. You know, Basically, you made boss shit. Flipping no. <laughs> <laughs> you said land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it was actually next door. No, uh, no. But when I when I when I worked for McDonald's on the digital uh, transformation program, they um, they really like like I, I was you know part of my onboarding is to really understand about how it how how it came yeah. you know with Ray Kroc and everything and I read I even read the book took time to read the book uh, when it was there. there great film um great actor yeah and uh you know everything that you read about in 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 the media because they they focus so much on the um fast food aspect you know yeah. this is unhealthy for you that's unhealthy for you well yeah. what isn't healthy for you know like it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah, yeah and they try to bring down the house right by doing that but they don't well, you know, it's, they don't really talk about the employees because they know nothing about the employees. When actually that company, McDonald's, is so well, it's a well-oiled, run. It, well, I can't speak, it's a well-oiled machine, yeah. right? It is run so well. There's a reason why people have been there 25 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I met folks who started off in the restaurants, worked their way all the way up into head office, into very senior roles. In fact, some of the CEOs uh, started off in the restaurants. The way that they look after their employees is amazing, yeah. incredible what i'm seeing in healthcare as well like these big it, it's all about your people if you're going to look at your people look at them as people don't all look at them as commodities not powered by people yeah it is <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. shameless <laughs> pretty good but, <laughs> but i think like with, with you know the other the other side of things that you can do with communities as well from a business perspective right so over the years, you know, when I've been working uh, on recruitment requirements and, and so forth, like potentially with niche skills, when I worked in a consultancy, I, I, I saw an opportunity to create, let's call it a practice. So it's a practice of community, practice all slash community of skills, specific skills. So you build, you build that up and you've always got like a talent pool yeah. to get into. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't see a lot of that still. Mm. I think it's a missed, a massive missed opportunity. Yeah. Right. Because you can build your own uh, internal communities. Now there are tools that exist to do that. Beamer is a great example. Candidate mm. ID is a great yeah. example. You know, where you can really kind of build and nurture those talents. But they are your, they, uh, that is a community for you. You know, if you're a consultancy, you know, where you can follow people, um, their career, when they're next available. It's, you know, that it is, it's un it's, it's, there's just so much opportunity. It's almost, I get excited by that. Yeah, yeah, no. It's almost seen as like, um, so agencies do this, I think, really well. Niche agencies in creating communities within their niches um, in order to be more effective when delivering on, on particular requirements. I'm not, not sure why uh, in-house don't do that more. Um, because that they have just as much it's opportunity pressure. to do so. It's time. It's time. And in, the, in, the, in that, in that really instance, I would say exactly. And, it's yeah. time and resource. You know. Yeah. Um, how how can you have time building up community when you've got to get people on boarded and hired in the next four weeks? Yeah. It's really hard to do. It's probably um, something that needs to be built into sort of the the overarching strategy, maybe. Or marketing. Or why, why is your marketing the employer branding yeah. piece, which yeah. you're sort of seeing um, employer marketing, uh, employer branding being a, a marketing right. agency. How many come hate for recruitment? Right? Yeah. So how many big companies do we know that have um, over a million followers on their LinkedIn page? No, they have, there's loads. Really? Yeah, over a million followers on their LinkedIn page. Big companies like big FG, yeah. you know, like yeah. Fifty One Hundred businesses. So. They they have they and they're great at sharing content and they're great at posting videos about what it's like to work there and everything. But I wonder how many of those actually reach out to those followers and say to them like, if you know we're hiring or whatever. But you know actually targeting them with real campaigns yeah. individually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably not many. No, because they haven't got many. Definitely not many. Yeah, they haven't got a million employees. For <clears throat> sure. So like, no, it's followers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I mean is, but but they're going to be that. That's their first. Is this something like you're more on a, on a, a recruitment email stat? Um, you're 64% more likely to respond to somebody if you are um, engaged, if you have engaged with their brand before. Correct. 
Um, so at those million followers, that's your like go-to talent pool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and rather than just engaging with that talent pool when you've got an open requisition, that there should be some, like you say, some nurturing. I mean, there are some ATSs that are building that in, but um, a candidate ID is a great example of, of a, a, a process or a system that's that's, great. that's nurtures all the way through. Um, it's a little bit like HubSpot for recruitment. <laughs> Right. Um, in nurturing sort of uh, marketing yeah. to a particular... But that's exactly what it is, by the way. Like it's, 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 well, not exactly, but it's very much like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and also, you don't, you never really see the... You can always tell the importance or how the priority of something in an organisation by the, the amount of people are actually looking at it. And teams within employer branding... Um, or recruitment or talent acquisition marketing are never that big. No. Um, because it's probably, it's, it's almost seen as like a nice to have um, as as opposed to like a, a more important function within the organisation. I think there's still a, a confusion as to where it sits, mm, right? Yeah, does it sit probably. with the marketing team? Does it sit yeah. with the people team? I mean, it sits with the people team. There's always a crossover with, is it on brand? Is it on message? Is tone of voice right? If it sits with the marketing team, then... Is it interrupting with the consumer messaging? Are we using the same channels to talk to our consumers as our people? It's, I feel like that is still very much a gray area. And if there's business out there that have the luxury of having an employer brand team in their people team, mm. then fantastic. But I'd assume yeah. that's not very common. It's not. I've seen it a few. I've seen a few people, a, a few TA leaders um, who are like head of talent acquisition and employer branding. Yes, yeah, so um, and that's becoming a little bit more common. Um, the difference is, you know, if it is a if it's a, a marketing role, the likelihood that a head of TA had any experience or even even knowledge in order to manage that. Yeah, but most yeah. don't anyway. But mo let's be honest, we like, most of us take on jobs that we don't have experience in, but we yeah. take it because we want to learn. Yeah. We we want to get that experience. And you you employ people, you know, if you're look if you have the responsibility of that role, it doesn't mean you you are doing it right. Mm. So you're employing people. Um, that are going to support you and, and, and have that knowledge base. Well, I guess where where is it sat in your the companies you've worked with, Steve? Has it been the the kind of internal message externally? Has that sat with you and your people teams, or has it been a an offshoot of a marketing organisation? I'd say the majority of yeah, the majority of them have been kind of more uh, sitting within TA. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah, not definitely not HR. Yeah. Um, yeah, more 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 aligned to TA, but then it, I suppose in a way that they are like the, the the cross kind of bridge over into marketing, yeah, recruitment yeah. marketing. I think if you if you as long as the as long as they're adhering to brand guidelines, correct, are set by the marketing team, yeah, course, then that you should you should be able to relay the whatever message you feel is necessary in order to to attract the right people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To your I'd love to have. Like in every company I've I've worked in, I would have loved to have had like a huge marketing team to work. Yeah, yeah. On employer brand, mm. I think it's just it's not it's not invested enough. No. You know, market marketing is used much more of a sales tool is, and yeah, supporting yeah. sales as well, rather than actually kind of really focused around that whole talent acquisition or recruitment aspect. But then again, now we have these channels like Instagram, TikTok, etc which are great and more companies are using those tools for recruiting purposes and they're working yeah they're working really well because it's reaching out to new demographics and new you know new generations which is uh which is what's needed right now because fact is you've got to keep up with the trends because well, yeah. if we're not if we're not communicating using the same tools and the same languages that everyone is using today how are you expected to to keep up yeah. no, you're just not gonna there's so much that. pressure actually to yeah. be able to do that as well by the way yeah. And, well, there's new ch and that's where that imp imposter syndrome, I think, comes into a lot of the There's new channels popping up all the time, right? It's like, it feels like only yesterday TikTok kind of burst onto the scene. Be and real. What is that? Are you part of that? <clears throat> Be real. Be real. It's a new one. Get on it. No, no, no. Great. I know someone who works there. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, he's raves about it. Yeah, I don't, it's, it's like a, you take a picture of you and it takes a picture of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. That is going to be... I think, I feel that's going to be very big. Yeah, it's the new thing. Don't, get, don't hate marks on it. But unless, sorry, unless you've got someone as a real life digital native that understands these channels and how you use them, 
then it's very easy to do it, to do it wrong, right? Yeah. Like, and I know technically if you're doing it at all, you're probably better than a lot of other people. But yeah. You want to be able to do it right. And I think going back to your point around where kind of, or our point around where marketing sits, it's always been interesting to me that from a HR point of view, and don't get me wrong, I'm not muddling up marketing the HR because the governance and stuff, compliance in HR is huge, but there's always been HR BPs. Why has there never been like marketing BPs? <laughs> because if every team has potentially a, a go-to-market message or even internally how they're communicating and kind of interlinking, there's never, I've never worked for a business that has like a marketing BP. I think that'd be really- Would they not be like marketing associates <laughs> then or not really? Maybe. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, it's, your, it's your department, whether that's HR or whether that's the people team or the talent team. But I guess it's like, depending, it's got to be aligned to the marketing st overall marketing strategy. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. So then you've got consistency and continuity across, you've got the nuances of the people team against like the go-to-market consumer team. But mm. to your point around making sure everything's on brand and on message and the tone of voice is correct, then you know you've got a physical rep or a, a physical rep in your department yeah. that understands all those things but can talk on your behalf. Yeah, I think that's really, it's not. It's a really good point, actually. And what we know is brand creates value, right? If you get yeah. the brand right, uh, often brands are, are, you know, worth more than the sum of all the parts of a business. Um, mm. And I said this on a, on a pod, another podcast uh, not too long ago, where if you ever watch on TV, um, like it's, oh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the bread company called? I guess Warburton's. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. so they, uh, you know, if you look at how kind of smiley they are and how they kind of, you know, they've got good, it's a good, um, advert of them working in the warehouse and how they yeah. package everything. Yeah. Everyone's happy and smiley and everything. I'm sure that's not in real life, but, <laughs> um, but it, you know, you kind of get a good sense of, of what the kind of culture and the values are yeah. and everything. And it's, it's good, you know, uh, hearty type business to work for. Yeah. Family friendly. Right. Let's get the feel that they're a family yeah. friendly organization. Right. But if you ever saw Coca Cola doing one like that, it would be a completely different story. They could yeah. probably kill their brand because yeah. what what is Coke you know, what is mainly in Coca Cola? Sugar. Yeah. So yeah. if you saw, you know, if if they posted an ad sorry, if they uh, displayed an advert which was just all family just basically yeah. like pouring loads of sugar into this drink. <laughs> yeah, just shattered it like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really bad for you. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't want to work there. That's all they need to drink it. Like, fuck, oh, Chris. Well, that's it, right? So they just, <laughs> they just cartoonize everything, right? So, um, it's funny though, isn't it? I, yeah, be honest. Like, just. Yeah, it's true. That authenticity, I think, is creeping into communities and into like, marketing more and more. So, you say about the, the shots of come and work with us. This is our warehouse, but there's people in like brand new high vises that have never seen, never seen a day's work in their life. <laughs> and not shiny new hard hat, brand new high vis. I work in here every day and I'm really happy. Arguably, like, I want to see people with like the dirty old high visits, but they're still happy and they're still having fun and they know like, they're the, that's the bread and butter of um, of your business, right? It's people that, that listen, that live and breathe real. it. Yeah, like, yeah. If you if you buy that, the clean high fees, you get there and you're dirty, you're like, fuck this, I quit. <laughs> I thought this was, everyone was going to be clean. Whereas if you understand what it's actually going to be like, I know this is just a metaphor for like other roles, yeah. but um, if you actually understand and that, you know, there is a sense of authenticity to the advert, to the, the employer brand, but that coming back to employer brand, you know, or having a marketing business partner, each, I see like marketing supports sales mm -hmm. in, uh, with, with building awareness and generating needs for the sales yeah, team. Right? That's that's yeah, that's where that's branding should be doing the same for talent acquisition. Right. It should be building brand awareness right. in the pools that we're looking to attract. Yeah. And and creating leads for the you know, for, for the opportunities that, that we, we have in terms of open requisitions. Well marketing is like we said in probably on the last one, marketing is the science of putting a product in front of someone that you think is gonna be receptive to that message, right? Yeah. Employee branding is the same. Putting your business in front exactly. of somebody that's yeah. looking looking for a new role. Well, it's also about it's like if but also don't forget, and it's connected to EVP, is that whatever you say out there, you must do within. Yes. Yeah, right? So very, if, if you don't, then you'll basically not being authentic. Your yeah. EVP, but, but that's the same as your product features. Right. So the, the authenticity kind of leading back to community is why it's so important to be like really authentic with yeah. your community when yeah. you're building it out. This is what right. we're about. Yeah, this don't turn it into a sales machine. No. 
don't use it as a business development tool. That kill that will kill you. You know, yeah. it's not it's not about that. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, but um... and support. You know, partnerships. You know, like partnerships are great. We've started building a marketplace on TTC um, where you know we were able to do um, partnerships with. Um, different HR tech vendors and we're able to offer discounts to our members, you know, they, cause they need them. Right. Like, so especially now, like, yeah, uh, especially now where budgets might have been cut. Yeah. Right. That's so true. they already got certain expenditure. Um, and, um, it's great that we're able to, uh, to build those partnerships with these organizations and, and some of them are startups themselves and, and they really, you know, want to, so we were able to actually offer those discounts. Uh, this, to, this works both ways, doesn't it, right? So you're giving value to the people, part of your, who are the consumers in that sense, in your um, in your community. Yeah. And then, But then also you're removing a huge marketing cost yeah. for suppliers. So therefore the discount is valid. Mm. Like yeah. you don't mind giving a discount because I haven't got to spend to acquire. Well, that's also very true, yeah. And so you're you're creating that, that community is connecting and, and Every part part of that bit, that community is getting value. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it's all about. Value's got to be the the biggest output. I think a, a, a fantastic thing around about the TTC. Obviously, we all know the talent community has been hit relatively hard recently with cuts and redundancies and stuff. And obviously, you've got channels on there of these are people looking for work, and then yeah. other people will share job opportunities. And yeah. I think that's a wonderful thing. That, yeah, again, organically, people are trying to support one another yeah it's, yeah it's really nice i think it's it's lovely to see and it's kind of it restores a bit of faith in humanity a little bit it does thank that you. people yes. are trying to help each other for no other reason than just trying to help yeah and again like i've been in agency before and i don't want to be you know i think agencies get a lot of hot, get, get a lot of stick you know um from in from outs you know from in-house communities as well uh, and it, it amazes me when some communities you know will talk badly about, you know, either HR tech products or like, uh, you know, or, or recruitment agencies when they know nothing about them. Yeah. Like it's, it's not the right, it's not, it's not the right kind of tone of voice that you want to be setting. And agencies have got, come a long way, I think, and, and developed a lot more than the, the way they were. I think there is this, but there's still that, that reputation of secondhand car salesman. Uh, with it, within, with, with some. Yeah, but you live and learn. I mean, you know, you've got to, you know, anyone that's building out a recruitment agency now, I'm sure that, you know, they're, they're going to make mistakes along the way and good, good, good for them. They should yeah. be making mistakes, right? Yeah, so yeah. That they get better as they go along. And, 100%. but then if they, but then if they have communities like TCC to be able to join, they could probably make those mistakes much earlier on than later yeah. down the line and then learn from that and, and, and pick up lots of good advice. Yeah. You know, we've introduced, um, uh, coffee top, you know, the, the random That's coffee, amazing, uh, I love it. and uh, it's going really well. Like, yeah, ra random people never met each other, having coffees, you know, uh, with each other, half an hour chats, yeah, and everyone's getting to know each other on a more kind of deeper level as well. Yeah. And I had a great chat with a recruitment agency, uh, not too long, you know, I think it was last week actually, in cybersecurity. Quite a young guy, been doing recruitment for like two years, and it was quite nice to kind of give him, you know, my experience. and give him some tips and stuff as well. It's, yes. That's what it's there for. hundred percent. I've met some great people through that. Yeah. And we're really great. Yeah, people. exactly. You have, you have. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So the talent community, another plug, www.thetalentcommunity.net. <laughs> ah, you got it. <laughs> um, right. So we have a closing tradition on this podcast. Completely original section. Completely original. Stephen Bartlett. Um, stop, does it? Should we change it? Okay, cool. Yes. Um, so we ask our previous guest <laughs> to write a question for our next guest. Our previous guest was the, the wonderful Gemma Lee from Conica Minolta, Chief People Officer. And she asks you, Stephen Jacobs, what do you think is the most critical slash different attribute you're bringing to your role? Say that again. Let me think. What do you think is the most critical attribute you bring to your role? Critical attribute to my role? Yeah. To the company, the team, or just to my role? What makes you great at what you do? Um, do that one. What do you say? I guess, this is going to sound really cheesy, but <laughs> me. Just being myself, because um, like any teams that I've managed you know, we'll, and if they're if they're listening to this, I think they will agree that I'm very transparent about everything. 
Yeah, I know he was. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 <laughs> uh, I'm very transparent. I'm very, you know, communication for me is absolute key. So it's, I'm very, you know, like, I will always be very open and honest about things, you know, giving feedback, taking feedback, listening, um, and yeah, just being really kind of, I always have this like open door policy to myself, right? And and I think the transparency is important because if you can't bring people into your kind of, you know. Mindset. Not, not, no, not really mindset. It's more kind of like um, trust circle in a way. Yeah. Right? Um, then how can you get them to do your little favours? No. <laughs> um, how, how can you, how can you, you know, how can you basically like, you know, trust back yeah you know so yeah I, I i've always been and maybe i'm a little bit oversharing at times possibly as well uh you know i can't help that it's just because i brought the overshare the number yeah definitely um but again finding the balance is important and it always depends on what you overshare um but that's just how, who i am as yeah. an individual uh, because, because i care I, I like i do care um about you know i've i've, I've had unfortunate uh, experiences in my life um, which has taught me a lot yeah. and uh, it makes me care more for people empathy yeah. definitely yeah. I guess it takes us back to the point around being authentic right That's if you thought you were authentic to yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. you can never be authentic to your team or you can exactly. Exactly. some people might look at you and go oh yeah he's talking rubbish and all that sort of stuff I'm like that's that's you know that's, that's what you think yeah, anyway. yeah. that's not my that's a you problem <laughs> yeah. okay well thank you for listening um, thanks, Steve, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Uh, it, I'm really great right insightful. Yeah. Great to be in the in the presence of royalty. How was that? Uh, stop <laughs> saying that. It's not royalty, honestly. Uh, um, no, uh, yeah, not royalty. Just to be clear. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, and thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to come on and talk about uh, TTC. You're very welcome. Um, and uh, I'll make sure that yes, so Sean and James and everyone else is gonna share it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Subscribe. Um, and we'll put all the links in the producer Rosie will put all the links in the um, in the, team in the team. description yeah Beautiful. ah yeah awesome thanks so much for joining and we'll see you next time well, f how did that come about and how did you move into into? to be completely honest it came out of um, a moment of desperation why because I was at a stage where it was just two of us my colleague and I and we had hired around 60 people in literally one quarter and at that point, towards the end of the queue, I was like, okay, we are killing it right now. We need to like stop and take a step back. 